Hello, welcome back to Dinosaurs. So welcome to week two. We're gonna continue through with module one. So we're done with the first three lectures here. Hopefully you've gotten time to read those, read through the PowerPoints, or hopefully even checked out those YouTube videos. So I've been narrating the lectures so that you have some more commentary on there. Uh, just because it's not on the slide doesn't mean it won't be on the assessment. I narrate through the things that I feel are important. So you definitely wanna be checking those out. Uh, keep in mind, you don't need to watch the whole thing in one sitting. That's one of the advantages of having the recorded, you know, 45, 50 minutes is a long time to sit and listen to me, blah, 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 blah. So, you know, you might want to start it, watch like for 20 minutes, take some notes, look back at your notes, restart, watch the rest of it, something like that, break it up into smaller chunks, whatever, it's up to you. The lecture is recorded, you can do what you want with it. Uh, today, we're going to talk about geology slash stratigraphy, which again, we kind of switch these on the course schedule. So if you're a little bit confused, don't worry about it. It's not gonna affect anything, but I'm gonna talk about geology stratigraphy first. Basically, how do we know what we pretend to know about the rock record and geologic history? And then we're gonna talk about fossils and basically classification and evolution for the rest of module one. And those are gonna be the foundational core concepts. I'll be trying to use dinosaurs as an example throughout but this is the stuff that we need to know before we get into the meat of the class, which of course is dinosaurs. Before we get into today's lecture though, a couple announcements. So, so hopefully that's clear for everybody. Uh, okay, so let's talk about geology slash stratigraphy. So one of the foundational concepts of geology is this idea of uniformitarianism. And we talked about this a little bit last time. So James Hutton went out to Sikar Point and he saw those outcrops there, the tilted strata that used to be flat. And he was like, oh, what's happened here? Those strata must have been tilted over time and eroded away. The earth must be really old. And those processes that I see working today must have been working for a really long time. So the idea of uniformitarianism is that things are uniform throughout time, the way that rivers work today so this is an example of a modern meandering river. Uh, we often think about rivers and landforms and stuff as kind of static and never and not changing. Uh, rivers are very dynamic environments. They shift around a lot. There's a lot of sediment movement. There's a lot of actually sculpting new paths, the abandonment of this oxbow lake here. The geology, the surface expression of the geology is constantly changing. How do we see that in the rock record? Well, the idea here is that the way that rivers work now is the way that rivers worked in the past, and that all of the geologic time is the result of these small, slow changes that add up over a long time. And so the river is just steadily work through time. Waves go in, waves go out, waves go in, waves go out. They take sediment in when they come in, they pull a little bit of sediment out when they go out, waves go in, waves go out, they build up the beach, and over millions of years, they do that for extended periods It slowly adds up into the rocks that we see, like the rocks behind me here. But if you think about it though, are all geologic processes slow and steady? Well, no. So there's some dramatic examples of really catastrophic geology events like landslides, or in the event of the dinosaurs, the uh, asteroid impact extinction event, so not all geologic events are slow and steady, but most are. So like the Hawaiian Islands, they're built up over time through slow, steady eruption of lava. But if you think of like Mount St. Helens, that's a catastrophic volcanic event. So not all geology is slow and steady, but most is. And the idea, the whole basis, the whole central tenet of geology is that we're trying to unlock the past what happened in the past. And Charles Lyell is kind of the one that came up with this, the famous quote, the present is the key to the past. What we see operating in the present is what we expect was operating in the past. If we go to a modern river and we start digging trenches and we look in the trenches and we look at the way the sediment, the mud, the sand, the silt is deposited, and we see all those structures, if we see that in the rock record, the hard rocks, we can kind of know, oh, well, this looks a lot like a modern river. It probably was an ancient river. 
And a lot of the physics that are operating on a modern river were probably operating in the ancient river as well. I saw on that last slide, the river meanders through time. It cuts off and it abandons oxbow lakes and it changes course. That happened in the geologic past as well. And we should be able to see that in the rock record. So this really kind of opened the door of these rocks that we see are not random. These rocks are created by geologic processes in the past. If we're able to understand those geologic processes in the present, we can kind of look for those hints in the past. And so again, the present is the key to the past. We look at what's happening today. We assume that over geologic time, things have behaved pretty uniformly and we can make predictions about what we see. So like, for example, behind me here, I have kind of a rhythmic deposition, some sand, a little bit of mud, another sand, a little bit of mud, another sand, a little bit of mud, some sand, kind of this rhythmic back and forth between coarse grained fine grains. We'll get into a little bit more in a second, but this kind of stuff is seen in deep water environments in the present. If we're making deposits like this in the present in the deep water, then if we see deposits like this solid in the rock record, we know that, oh, that was probably an ancient deep water environment. And then fossils help us out as well. If I look into some of these rocks, I might see deep water creatures in there. Uh, so this was kind of, so Hutton kind of set the stage with finding deep time and saying that, oh, the earth must be really, really old. And Lyell was like, yeah, it's really old. And it's been operating the same way with the same processes. And there's this kind of idea with like really long-term thinking. And uh, Charles Darwin actually had a copy of Principles of Geology with him when he was on the Voyage of the Beagle. It was a kind of hot off the presses, new innovative stuff like, oh my God, the earth is super old and we can determine what happened in the past by identifying what's happening in the present. And Darwin sort of internalized that lesson and was like, that's probably happening in nature too. If I look at things that are happening now in nature, that stuff was probably happening with natural processes back in the past too. And so these things are kind of linked. And we're going to be talking about this throughout the course, where if we want to know what the ancient geologic environment looked like, look at the rocks, try to figure out what's going on in the rocks. If you want to look at what the life looked like, look at the fossils. And we can look at it with an, a scientific approach, a systematic approach. So we basically try to read the rocks. So the rocks tell stories. There's this quote, uh, rocks are verbs, not nouns. So like sandstone, a kind of rock, that's a noun. But the fact that it is a sandy rock, it has sand-sized grains, tells a geologist something that it must have been a pretty high energy environment. Where do we find sand in the modern? Beaches, rivers, that kind of thing. So we, we know that high energy environments have sand in the modern. If we encounter a sand in the past, we kind of understand that. So uh, geologists can kind of quote unquote read the rocks and read their story. The rocks are telling us something. If we go to this outcrop here and we see this rhythmic back and forth between coarser stuff and finer stuff, we know this is a little bit high energy or environment, a little bit lower energy or maybe there is more stuff being eroded off here and then maybe less here. We can kind of read through these rocks and get a story. Uh, and again, modern systems operate in a very similar way to the way that ancient systems did. So for example, uh, relevant to this class, this is a bird. I think it's a swan. I'm not a bird expert, but I think it's a swan. Uh, it's making swan footprints in the sand. And you'll notice that they have kind of that three toe pattern. Remember that birds are relatives of dinosaurs. And this is a geologist on a Mesozoic outcrop. So at least 66 million years old. And what are you seeing? Three toed footprints in the sand. You can even see some ripples on this rock surface. This rock now is hard rock. It's solidified, but it's retained the evidence of the water kind of rippling gently over the sandy surface. It's retained the evidence of whatever dinosaur this was stepping into the mud and leaving that impression. And now tens of millions of years later, in some cases, hundreds of millions of years later, 
we're able to see that evidence, we're able to piece it together. It's almost like forensic science, you know, like police would have examine like footprints or tire tracks leaving a crime scene. We can examine tire tracks, dinosaur tracks uh, in the ancient past and try to piece together the story. What were they doing? Were they walking together? Were they stalking prey? Was it one individual? Was it multiple individuals? How heavy were they by how far they sank into the ground? We'll talk about all this later in the course, but just know that these, these rocks record the stories. When we say like this ancient environment was a swampy coastal environment or a dry desert environment, or it got wetter or it got drier over time, uh, we're not making this up. The rocks tell us stuff. We're able to read that story. Uh, if you wanna get deeper into it, you can take geology classes and become one of those people that can read the rocks. But for now, for this class, just know that you can. There are things that you can know from the geologic record by making observations and comparing what we see in the geologic past in the rocks to what we see in the geologic present in the sediments, like this sandy beach here with the swan kind of walking on there. So some examples, so river deposits. So most sedimentary rocks, which are the, the layer rocks. So if you remember back to high school earth science, there's igneous rocks, the rocks that form from lava or magma. There's metamorphic rocks, the rocks that form from swishing and squeezing, heating and pressure that change the rock like mighty Morphin Power Rangers metamorphic rocks. And then there's the sedimentary rocks. For this course, we're gonna be almost exclusively talking about sedimentary rocks because the creatures are living on the sediments. They're living on the sand. They're living on the mud. They're living on the dirt. They're not living in lava. They're not living in magma. They're not living in igneous rocks. They're not living deep under the earth where things are being squished and squeezed. They're not present in metamorphic rocks either. So when we're putting on our geologic detective hat, at least for the story of life, we're talking about sedimentary rocks. Most sedimentary rocks are deposited by water. So rivers, lakes, oceans. Obviously there's exceptions to this. There's a lot of different other ways that you deposit sediment. But for example, this is a modern river. You see that this modern river has a main channel here. There's another channel kind of coming off. It's not straight. It meanders around. We saw previously that these meanders actually move in time and space. If we cut through the river and look at it from the side, like hypothetically, we see that there is a channel here with some coarser stuff at the bottom where the water is kind of moving the fastest. That's a modern river. If we go to the rock record, this is an a outcrop of ancient rock. We see here is a cut, a valley, a river channel. We see coarser material in the channel. We can see that it's kind of got like a reddish oxidation there, a rust that tells us that it was a terrestrial environment. So on land with oxygen available to rust the iron minerals that are present. And then we have kind of the sandy cap here back to a finer grained, lower energy environment. You can read through these rocks, read the story. We know what modern rivers look like and we can see ancient rivers in the rock record. The organisms that were living along this time were interacting with that river, living alongside of it. In some cases, they would die and be swept into the river and become part of that deposit. Uh, so water creates most rocks, but wind creates some too. Uh, we're going to be talking a little bit about Pangaea, the big supercontinent. At the time that dinosaurs really first started appearing, Pangaea was a full supercontinent. All the la ma mass of all the land on Earth was assembled into one large continent. And then over the time that the dinosaurs were alive, it split apart. So Pangaea was exceptionally arid. It was a massive desert in the interior of this big continent. And a lot of the famous dinosaur beds that we'll talk about later in the course were found in desert environments where it wasn't water that was transporting the grains, it was wind. And how do we figure that out? Well, we go to modern environments where wind is moving the sediments. So like, for example, this, these are some dunes in the Sahara Desert. We see these massive big scale dunes and superimposed on there, we see these tiny little ripples, these little wind ripples. This is the modern, this is what modern sand dunes look like. Again, we could like dig a trench through them, look at the interior layers. 
Uh, and then we can go to places on Earth. This is out west in North America. We see the same big tipped beds. They're called cross beds. These are the interior remains of these old dunes. They're the same features that we see in these dunes, but they're frozen in the rock record. And this record remains. So we go to a rock outcrop and we see, wow, there are these large scale kind of sweeping cross beds. That's probably uh, an ancient sand dune. It's probably a desert environment. And then we look around, like, are we seeing desert sort of plants and animal remnants? Is that kind of what we'd expect? And looking at all the evidence that's available to us and piecing the story together, just kind of quote unquote reading the rocks. And so basically the one thing that I want you to carry away from this is that uh, grain size is the most important characteristic that we're going to look at with sedimentary rocks. And that's one reason why we use grain size to classify sedimentary rocks. So for example, sandstone is a stone that's made out of sand-sized grains. Where do we find sand? We find sand at beaches because beach waves are high energy. If you go down to Rudy's or Bev's here on the Oswego shoreline, the waves are really high energy and we see gravels. If you go to like Rice Creek, a very slow, low energy flow, there's not a lot of energy to move sediment around. You get a mud of fine grain stuff. So uh, think about these two analogies here. Uh, here's the rock. Uh, he's a very big fan of geology. Obviously, he posted on Twitter how much he likes geology and paleontology. Uh, he's got a little tiny squirt gun there. That, the water is not moving very fast. If you were to try to move sand with it, it wouldn't work. There's not enough energy there to push sand-sized grains. Now, if you have a fire hose, a uh, fire hose is going to move a lot of stuff. They use fire hoses to move people at certain you know, crowd suppression tactics. Um, you know, kind of frowned upon, but they do it. Um, you can see the force that this thing has. It actually picks this guy up and, and throws him. He's much bigger than a sand grain. So the one thing here, remember ancient environments, basically how big the grains are that make up the rock is in a lot of ways a proxy for how much energy there is. The coarser the grains are, the higher the energy environment is. The smaller the grains are, the muddier it is, the lower the energy. So like, for example, here's a cross section from like the beach, right at the beach, you see sand sized stuff. As you go further offshore into the deeper, calmer waters, you start getting mud. And then if you get even farther out, you start getting stuff that's like a little shellier, more like actual organism remains. And so that's the level that you kind of need to understand here is like geologists can read the rock record by looking at the grain size, by looking at the shapes that are present by looking at the structures that are present and we can kind of reconstruct that environment. Like, oh, this is a sandy outcrop. I see a lot of shapes that look like things I see on modern beaches. I see imprints of animal footprints in this sand. This was probably an ancient beach. We're able to reconstruct that ancient environment from looking at the layers of rocks. So that's kind of the geology story. The present is the key to the past. Understanding how geology works in the present unlocks the ability to kind of predict what was going on in the past. And the way we do that is with this uh, field of geology called stratigraphy. So stratigraphy, which is probably a word you haven't heard before, stratigraphy is a branch of geology. I am a stratigrapher. It, we study the layers of the earth, the, the strata, Stratigraphy is the study of strata, study of layers, study of this layer cake of the earth. And again, these layers stack up. The oldest stuff's at the bottom, the newest stuff's at the top. And if we kind of look at it layer by layer by layer, each layer has its own story. Each layer in this rock outcrop has its own story. Here's kind of a higher energy sand, lower energy shales here, higher energy sand, lower energy mud. You see the cyclicity, you see this back and forth between higher energy sand, lower energy mud. We can read each individual page and we can stack it up into a big story. That's what stratigraphy is. So here's an example of a, a couple of geologists out in the field. Uh, when you're out in the field, it's very important that you point that stuff. So there's a geologist pointing at stuff 
And what they're doing is they're using these little sticks here with these measurements on there. They're measuring how thick each layer is. Here's another example here. This is a stick that you would use to measure the thickness of the layers. You describe what's going on in the layer. Then you go up to the next layer. You describe what's going on in that layer. And then you put the story together and it's almost like reading a book. Like the first layer might be like, oh, this is a very dry, arid environment. I'm seeing desert sand dunes. And then I go up a little bit farther forward in time. And now, oh, I've got rivers cutting down through and I see freshwater fossils. The environment has gotten wetter. It's gotten more hospitable. And I probably start seeing more organisms. I can read through bottom to top and reconstruct the environment from reading through these pages, these layers, these strata. So the strata, each individual strata is called a bed. So a bed is kind of a unit of the rock that's it's different from what's above and different from what's below. So like, for example, here, uh, this is a bed of sand from here to here. It's different from the shale above, different from the shale below. Shale's that rock that kind of breaks into the little thin pieces that are good for skipping rocks. The sand you see here is a little bit, little bit chunkier. So these beds are what puts the strata in stratigraphy. They're the layers. They're the strata that we, you, that we look at. And they're usually separated by bedding planes. There's an upper bedding plane and a lower bedding plane that forms the top and bottom boundary. Uh, if we look at the geometry of those beds, uh, it can tell us stuff. So if the bed's kind of cutting down, that might be a river. If there's graded bedding, it might be deposited in water. If we see shells that are stacked up like dominoes in a given direction, we might see an in individual flow. If we see ripples, if you go to a modern river, you'll see ripples in the sand or ripples in the shale, the mud, that's showing you which way the river is flowing. Again, if we see these big cross beds, these big sweeping broad cross beds, that might be sand dunes. And if we see planar, it means that it just kind of settled out of suspension, more kind of like these behind me into a quiet, calm water. One thing to bear in mind is that these layers, these beds, they don't necessarily represent individual events. So this mud layer here doesn't necessarily indicate one event. It might accumulate over tens of years or hundreds of years, or in some cases, even millions of years, if the deposition rates are really low. But just keep in mind that, again, strata, layers, beds, make up the rock record, the pages of the rock record. And if we know what we're looking at, we can read through it and read the story from top to bottom. So there is a hierarchy in stratigraphy that it starts at the level of a bed. So this is a bed. If we put a whole bunch of beds together, you might call it a member. And then a bunch of members is a formation. Uh, the only reason that I'm mentioning this is because I'm gonna be using this word formation quite a lot. So for example, the Morrison Formation or the Cedar Creek Mountain Formation. These are geologic units that represent stacks of these beds that are linked together somehow. And so for example, we're going to talk later about the Morrison Formation, the dinosaurs of the Morrison Formation. The Morrison Formation is this slab of rock made up of a bunch, bunch of pages of these beds that tells a story about what was going on at that time. These are the dinosaurs, the fauna of the Morrison Formation, the dinosaurs that were around at that time. So one thing to keep in mind is that not all dinosaurs lived at the same place or the same time. They were lumped into these faunas. So this is the Morrison Formation fauna. You see Allosaurus, Apatosaurus, Stegosaurus, Brachiosaurus, Ceratosaurus, these dinosaurs here are present in the Morrison Formation. They are not present in these younger units. This fauna is unique to the Morrison Formation, and it's a time, it's a place in time where these critters are around. Dinosaurs spanned more than 100 million years of time. There were a lot of different types of dinosaur communities and they didn't all live at the same time. So keep that in mind that uh, one thing that always blows people's mind is that, you know, you watch Jurassic Park, you see a Tyrannosaurus Rex, you see a Stegosaurus, 
and you see a person. The Tyrannosaurus rex and the Stegosaurus are separated by more geologic time than we are from Tyrannosaurus rex. Tyrannosaurus rex died out 66 million years ago. We're 66 million years removed from Tyrannosaurus rex. Tyrannosaurus rex is about 80 million years different from Stegosaurus. There's 80 million years of all these different dinosaurs that live between those two dinosaurs. They did not live at the same time. They lived vastly different times in vastly different environments at vastly different places on the globe. Uh, how do we know that? By reading the geologic story, by looking at the Morrison Formation and piecing together those layers, then going up to the Cedar Mountain Formation, looking at those layers, uh, et cetera, et cetera, going to different places around the world, looking at those formations, piecing the story together. So I just said that the dinosaurs died out 66 million years ago. The Mesozoic, the age of the dinosaurs started 252 million years ago. Uh, how do we know those numbers? How do we date things in geology? There's these layers here. And I know that the oldest stuff's on the bottom, the youngest stuff's on top, but I have no idea how old this is. So how do we do that? Well, there's a couple, there's two different ways that we date rocks and the, contain, the stuff that's contained in those rocks. So one way is relative dating. So rocks are older or younger than the surrounding rocks. So for example, uh, here's everybody's favorite family. Uh, the Simpsons have kind of gone downhill lately, but they're still cool, right? Uh, right? <laughs> I'm not that old, am I? So, for example, relative dating, Homer is the oldest Simpson. That doesn't say anything about how old he is, what exactly his age is, but he's the oldest. Now, obviously, Grandpa is way older and Burns is older than that, but uh, Maggie is the youngest Simpson relative to all the others. Bart is the older brother. He's older than Lisa. Again, it doesn't say how old. That's relative dating. Absolute dating is ages. So Homer is uh, 34. He was 34 at the beginning. They aged him to 39 eventually. That's an absolute date. That's a number. Lisa's eight. Marge is 36. Those are numbers. Those are absolute dates. Uh, so th th that's relative dating versus absolute dating. So let's talk about how we relative date rocks. So the one we've already talked about is superposition. The layers on the bottom are the oldest, and the ones that are on the top stack up on them, they're the youngest. So think about a laundry basket. Today's Monday. You get home from school. You take off your school clothes. You throw them in your laundry basket. They're going to end up on the bottom of your laundry basket. Come home tomorrow, you're going to throw those clothes in the laundry basket. They end up on top of those clothes. Come home Wednesday, throw those in the laundry basket. They end on top of both of those. By the time you get to Sunday, probably time to do the wash. The stuff you wore on Saturdays on the top, the stuff that you wore all the way back on Mondays on the bottom, the oldest stuff's on the bottom, the youngest stuff's on the top. Somebody, if they wanted to figure out what order you wore stuff in, they could go into your room look at the laundry basket and figure it out. That would be super weird. I hope nobody's trying to do that, but you could using superposition, using relative dating. The stuff that's on the bottom was first, the stuff that's younger is on the top. Now, of course, all bets are off if you've shuffled through and disturbed things. And that's true of the rock record as well. When there's these major tectonic upheavals, things get buckled and folded. Sometimes superposition doesn't work anymore, but it's usually right. The oldest stuff's on the bottom, the youngest stuff's on the top. As you move up through the rocks, you're getting old, uh, sorry, younger and younger and younger. The oldest stuff's on the bottom, the youngest stuff's on the top. Another thing that we can use is cross cutting. So an event that cuts across other layers is younger than those layers. So the, a good example here is slicing a pizza. Uh, you don't slice a pizza before it's cooked. You slice a pizza after it's cooked. So in this event here, this slicer is cutting through, it's cutting through the pizza, you know, first of all, that the pizza was already cooked. Also, you know that since the slicer is cutting through the pepperoni, it's cutting through the cheese, it's cutting through the dough, you know that that stuff was there already. You can't cut something that's not there yet. The All the stuff on the pizza is older than the cutting, 
because it cross cuts through all that stuff. Uh, and then the last one is the law of inclusions. So a layer that includes pieces of another layer is younger than that layer. So like a fruitcake here has lots of included pieces of fruit. You can't put fruit into the fruitcake if the fruit doesn't already exist. So in this case, the, the green stuff, whatever the green stuff is, the red stuff, the yellow stuff, you had to get that first. That stuff already existed before the fruitcake. If you find a rock and it's got pieces of another rock inside of it, you know that that rock was older to get the pieces and the rock that has in there is younger. So let's take a look at some examples here. So superposition, the oldest rocks are on the bottom, the youngest rocks are on the top. These rocks here are older, possibly much, much older than these rocks up here at the top. Cross-cutting, if we look at this, there's kind of the gray layer, this white layer, another gray layer here. Those are, this one's the oldest because it's on the bottom. This one's second oldest, this one's third oldest. And then there's this event that cuts through all three of those. This one's younger than those three. Those had to be there first for it to cut through. And then this thing cuts through all of it. So this thing's even younger than this thing because it cuts that too. So you're able to kind of piece that out. You can work through with fractures, you can work through with all different things, but cross-cutting works. You can't break a rock unit that doesn't exist yet. You can't make an intrusion through a rock unit that doesn't exist yet. And then there's the inclusion. So here is a injection of magma that's cooled down into a rock. Uh, the injection of that magma was so forceful that it ripped pieces of this rock from the sides off and incorporated it into the flow. We see these chunks of gray wall rock in here. We know that these gray chunks had to exist before this intrusion. And so this inclusion is, is younger. So that's relative dating. Again, we don't know how much younger. So for example, uh, this might be 60 million years. This might be 30, this might be 10. All we know is that it's younger to some degree. We don't know the exact date. To do that, we need to do absolute dating. So absolute dating uses the atomic clock to calculate a precise numeric age. So Homer was 34, Marge was 36. That's absolute dates. Marge was older than her children. That's relative dating. Uh, so how does this work? Well, again, it's, it's the radioactive clock, atomic clock. Radioactive isotopes break down at a constant and predictable rate. So for example, carbon-14, we often hear of like carbon-14 dating for human artifacts. Carbon-14 dating has a half-life of 5,700 years. Half of the carbon-14 is gone after 5,700 years. That's its half-life. Half-life is the amount of time it takes for half of the material to go away. So for example, if we start out with an initial of 40 milligrams of carbon-14, after one half-life, 5,700 years, we'll have 20 milligrams left. After two half-lives, 57 plus 5,700 is uh, 11,400. Uh, after two half-lives, that's how much is left. So each half-life, uh, how much is the material? In this case, it's 500 years. It takes 500 years to get here. That's one half-life. Another 500 years to get here. That's 1,000 years. If we had only 5 milligrams left, it'd be 1,500 years. Uh, carbon-14 doesn't work for dinosaur age stuff because it, 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 the half-lives are too small. So we need to use like uranium dating or some other potassium dating. So we'll, we'll talk about that a little bit later. But um, again, the assumption here is that the present is the key to the past, uniformitarianism, radioactive elements decay in the present. They decayed in the past at the same rate. If that wasn't true, things would get kind of out of whack, but we don't see that. So the data support the fact that this has been uniform over time or varies in ways that we fully understand and we're able to use it systematically and we don't see any exceptions. Yeah, that doesn't mean they don't exist, but so far so good. All right, so let's practice a little bit. So this is a cross section here and we're gonna date these events here, these geologic events from oldest to youngest. Uh, the best way to do this is to start at the bottom and work your way up from the top. 
So law of superposition, the oldest stuff's on the bottom, the youngest stuff's on the top. So the first thing is the thing that's on the bottom, the siltstone. The siltstone is deposited. Siltstone is a stone that's made out of silt. Silt is finer grain than sand, a little bit coarser than mud. So this is kind of like a medium energy environment. The next layer up is the limestone. Limestone's the next thing. We deposit limestone. Limestone is usually marine, usually kind of quiet-ish water, but there are some exceptions to that. Uh, now, what comes next? Well, this granite intrusion cuts across both of them. So law of cross-cutting, the granite intrusion is definitely younger than the siltstone and the limestone. Is it younger than the shale? Well, it's not on top of the shale, and it doesn't cross-cut the shale, so, so no, it's not. The next thing that happens is the granite intrusion. You see there's kind of this erosional surface here. Then we deposit the shale on top of that. Now, what comes next? This, we're to this layer here, the shale. The next thing on top is the vesicular basalt. Basalt is an igneous rock. The basalt is extruded. It cooked the bottom here. You can see contact metamorphism. It cooked the bottom here. And then the last thing is the sandstones deposited on top. This is oldest to youngest. But how old, how, how old is the shale? All we know from relative dating, from superposition and cross-cutting, is that the shale's younger than the limestone, but, but older than the basalt. So let's say that the granite here is 125 million years old. Uh, it's an igneous rock, we can date it. And the basalt's an igneous rock, we can date that too using atomic radioactive dating, get absolute ages numbers. It's a lot harder to do that with sedimentary rocks. So what we can say for sure is that the shale is younger than 125, because it's above the granite here, it's older than 115. So let's say 120 something like that. Uh, if we're able to bracket that a little bit closer, we can get the age a little bit finer. If we know the ages of certain fossils that are in the shale, that can get us even closer. Uh, but this is how we get these numbers. So we're able to date events and bracket them in time. So we know that the dinosaurs went extinct at 66 million years old because we see lava flows that we're able to date where below them we have dinosaurs and above them we don't. So here's the overarching story here, the geologic record. This is the Grand Canyon. And we see all the way to the bottom of the canyon, there's some metamorphic rock, really old. And then as we work our way up, we have these layers, these strata. Each of these layers is a story in the book of time. And if we know how to read those pages, we can put that story together. Now, one thing that's very clear at the Grand Canyon is that there's these older metamorphic rocks, then there's a erosion surface, stuff's been removed. There's another sequence of rocks and they're tilted. And remember from Hutton, things are originally horizontal. It takes tectonic activity to tilt them, that takes time. And then they've also been eroded, that also takes time. This was like a, a mountain range, a structure here that's been started horizontal, was tipped and then actually beveled off flat. And then new, new younger stuff was deposited on top of that. So one problem with the geologic record is that there are pages missing. Uh, in some cases, lots of pages. This is probably, this surface here represents hundreds of millions of years that are gone out of the record. There's no pages. So think about like a novel. Let's say that you tore out an entire chapter. Would you be able to follow the story? Probably vaguely. Uh, let's say you only tore one page out, it'd be really easy to piece the story together. If you tore out half the book, then it's gonna get much diff more difficult. So areas where we're missing a lot of the rock record, uh, life gets tricky, but you're still able to try to piece things together through context. So like I knew what was happening before these pages were ripped out. I see what was happening after the pages are ripped out, what probably happened in between where I don't have any pages remaining. Or like think about like Netflix, you're watching a Netflix movie and you fall asleep and you wake up 10 minutes later. If the plot's not moving very fast, you probably don't miss anything and you piece it together. If stuff's happening really quickly though, you might not. 
And the one thing about geology is it's not static. We see these rocks, we think of them as timeless, not moving around. The continents, the oceans are always moving around. They're smashing into each other. The Himalayas are being uplifted. They're being eroded away. The Grand Canyon here is carving down through these rocks, eroding them away. Geology is alive. Geology is currently functioning. Rocks are being deposited. Rocks are being removed. Pages are being added. Pages are being torn out because of tectonics. So let's talk about tectonics real quick. The very, like the five minute version, maybe 10 minute version. Uh, so one thing that was very quickly noticed ever since the world was sort of mapped is that the continents sort of fit together like puzzle pieces. So like this coast of South America kind of nestles right into this coast of Africa. This coast of Africa kind of nestles right in here on the east coast of North America. So uh, primarily it was viewed as just a curiosity where, you know, obviously it's just a coincidence that it just kind of looks like it. There's no way that the continents actually moved around. Um, but that was already very clear at like the first good map. So this is Theatrum Orbis Terrarum, the theater of the world in 1570. We already had maps that were detailed enough that we could see this strange coincidence that the, the continents looked like puzzle pieces. So it wasn't until kind of the 1900s when Alfred Wagner, uh, he was not a geologist, he was a meteorologist, he was working up in Greenland. Uh, he was looking at ice sheets uh, kind of breaking up and floating away from each other. And what he saw was, you know, that's kind of cool. If you move the ice pieces back together, you can see where they came from. You can see where they broke off from. You can see how long they've been drifting apart. And he was like, well, I wonder if that's what happens with the continents. So he called his theory continental drift, that the continents slowly drift apart over time. And he was widely ridiculed at the time because like, how could solid continents move around? Well, we didn't quite have the answer yet, but he did have a lot of evidence to support that they did. So one was, uh, there's these climate belts where if you put the continents together, the belts make sense. There's a nice continuous belt of constant coal swamp environment. And if you move them apart, it's very sporadic and weird. Again, the geometry, they look like puzzle pieces. The rocks on the North American side and the African side, the Appalachian Mountains, the Atlas Mountains, they match up with each other. They're very similar, even though they're separated by an entire ocean. If you put them all back together, there's fossils that make a lot more sense. So this is kind of evidence that the continents were probably pieced together. There's a lot of stuff that makes a lot more sense in the context of the continents being smushed together like those puzzle pieces. Uh, in World War II, we started collecting some more evidence about what the seafloor actually looks like. So uh, up until this point, it was sort of assumed that the ocean floor was just kind of flat and featureless and there's nothing down there and who cares. Uh, but uh, necessity is the mother of invention. During World War II, German U-boats, Unterseeboots, were destroying allied ships and they were very successful at doing it and they needed to think of a way of like how do we deal with these submarines and so they started using sonar which sends sound pings down in to the ocean it hits objects and bounce back uh, it also hits the seafloor and bounces back and so while they were looking for these german submarines these german u-boats they were sort of accidentally mapping the seafloor as well. And what they found was that the ocean floor is not flat and featureless at all. There's actually a lot of topography down there. There's underwater mountains, underwater canyons. So that was kind of weird. So after the war was over, the first scientific effort to map the seafloor was started. So this is the Atlantis, uh, a sail ship. So that was kind of cool to still have a sail ship at that time. Uh, they did like these global voyages to try to map out what the sea surf, the sea floor looked like underneath all of that ocean water. Uh, it was actually illegal to publish any of these maps. So there wasn't a lot of like development on these fronts for quite a while because the Cold War data was kind of locked down and kept secret. But one of the first people to really kind of assemble this is, uh, so Marie Tharp, uh, she's becoming more famous now, but she was overlooked for a while. Uh, she worked under Bruce Heason at Lamont Doherty Earth Observatory, which is, is still around and still studying the oceans to this day, but this was the 1950s. Uh, she wasn't actually permitted to go on 
the ocean voyages because of you know chauvinism women were not allowed on the boats superstition and just sexism uh, but she did assemble the data that they gathered into the first seafloor map so this is her map and it really kind of changes the way that we viewed the oceans she did this painstaking work of taking these little lines that was collected by ships and kind of piecing it together into this beautiful view of the oceans. She even made it into like a 3D model. And what we saw was this weird global mountain chain that goes all the way around the whole earth, like seams on a baseball, this big mountain chain under the water. Nobody expected that to be there. So what was it? Well, Harry Hess in 1960 used her map and explained that that big rift all the way around the whole earth uh, was new crust being created. This is a great, great global rift. So new crust was being created at the middle of the oceans and old crust was being destroyed at the margins. What was causing these plates to move around? Well, that was the problem. So Alfred Wegener, his continental drift, he thought they just kind of like plowed through solid rock and that was wrong. Harry Hess made the assumption that it was convection in the mantle. So just like convention on your stove, you heat up the water, the water rises up, it hits the top of the water, it spreads apart, it cools and it comes back down. That's a convection current or a convection cell. Or you think about a lava lamp, a lava lamp, you got the light at the bottom, a heat source, it heats up the wax, the wax gets hot, it gets less dense, it rises, it cools, it gets more dense and it sinks. And you get this loop, this convection current this is the mechanism that drives plate tectonics. It drives air balloons, hot air balloons. It drives lava lamps. It drives storm cells. It drives the convection around your house with your uh, radiators and things like that. Um, so here's some plate tectonic motion. So again, uh, hot rises, kind of pulls these conveyor belts along for the ride cools and sinks, hot rises, pulls along for the ride, cools and sinks, hot rises, pulls along for the ride, pulls the ocean apart, spreads apart, widens the oceans, pushes the continents farther apart, and then it cools <clears throat> and it sinks and the slab goes below. Uh, this is a video here of plate tectonic motion showing what the plates looked like in the geologic past what, they'll look, what they look like in the present and what they'll look like 100 million years from now. So I'm not gonna play this, but it is embedded in the PowerPoint. Uh, feel free to play it through on your own. It's very interesting. Remember the time frame about 250 to about 66, that's what we're looking at for dinosaurs. So uh, we start at kind of Pangaea and then it sort of rips apart. Uh, and this is kind of what the Mesozoic world looked like. So in the early Triassic, when dinosaurs were first getting started, this is what the world looked like, Pangaea, all Earth. All of the land masses of Earth were assembled into one big continent with the Panthalassic Ocean, all of the global oceans with those, a smaller Tethys Ocean here. Not Pacific, not Atlantic, different words, different oceans. Uh, in the late Cretaceous, towards the end of the age of the dinosaurs, or really this is kind of like the height of the dinosaurs, about 30 million years before they go extinct. Uh, we start seeing things that we recognize. Here's America, you see the Atlantic's very narrow. It had just started opening. South America and Africa just recently rifted apart from each other. And so when dinosaurs started, they could freely roam the entire earth over the supercontinent. By the time the end of the age of dinosaurs, they were kind of partitioned off into these individual continents. So, Dinosaurs were separated in space and in time. So keep that in mind. And again, we're talking about the Mesozoic. Uh, that's all I have for today. I hope you found that interesting. Uh, if you have any questions, post up on the discussion board. Just keep following along. And I will see you next time. Goodbye.